Hello and welcome to episode 13 of the Build a Soil YouTube series. This is season three, and right now is a big day because we're flipping the flower. What we have to do is follow through with the setup of the 4x4 tent. So if you haven't seen this yet, in one of the last episodes we documented this tent and showed you that we we're going to be using it soon. The brand is AC Infinity. I really like them. If you're familiar with the fans that we use, we've been using the AC Infinity. I'll grab one. Inline fans for a long time. This is the cloud line. This is what it looks like. It's sitting on top of the tent. And they have an S series, which gives you speed control. And it just comes with an up and down speed control. That's what we have on some of the other tents. We normally use that function when we're using a controller for the grow room. If you don't want to invest in a controller, which is usually what's going to happen in a four x four tent, you can use the built-in setting on the T8 fan or the T6 or the T4. That number represents the inches. This is a four x four tent. We don't need a ton of air movement. So we're using a four inch AC Infinity fan. And since this is an AC Infinity tent, they give you a mounting location with a bracket to, to actually put the screen on. That gives you the ability to read the temperature, the humidity and everything else without going in there. And that's nice because in a four x four tent, in Colorado, I'm fighting to keep the humidity up. And if I open the door, it drastically changes the humidity and the temperature. So I don't want to go in there and open it and close it and open it and close it and open it and close it. It just gives a little bit of stress on the environment that I'm trying to produce. It's important before we move the plants in here that we actually have the grow environment dialed. And I've given you some parameters. If you follow the build a soil way, we have a schedule. In the schedule, I think the most important part besides all the additives you could use um, are the it's the um, environmental control section. And it tells you along the way, hey, this is a good VPD, which is temperature and humidity. And there's also the DLI, which is the intensity of the light over a period of time. Once you get those right, your plants should be in a really good environment. And this fan is one of the best ways to get there without having the grow room controller and all the extras that we normally get. So let me grab the schedule and I'll show you what we're shooting for. All right, now this is pretty rough. It's been printed out for a while. You can download your own for free at buildasoil.com, educational tab, and go to the growing system. This is at the bottom and you can download it. And if you look in here, we're gonna go into bloom, the bloom transition, the stretch period. It's weeks one through four of flower. We're gonna switch the lights to 12 hours on, 12 hours off in the big tent. But since this is gonna be the auto flower tent, a lot of auto flower grow, grow, growers like to use 18 hours on and six hours off. That's what we're gonna do here. And I'm just gonna use a regular timer to do that. So we'll talk about that later. Besides that, what I'm interested in here is the environment. It says 70 to 80 degrees. 57 to 65% humidity is what we're looking for. And so I'm gonna set it at 65% humidity and 80 degrees. I might ride above or below that depending on whether you have a controller or whether you're using a fan like this and I'll talk to you about it. But if you look up here, you can see right away it's 76 degrees. So we're in that 70 to 80 degrees window that we're looking for. And then percentage of humidity, 57 to 65, we're at 66% right now. The reason why it's flashing high humidity is I have that setting right here at 65% is my setting. And it's above that at 67. So now it's turned the exhaust fan on. You can see it sucked the tent in just a little bit and it's exhausting that air until the humidity lowers to its target setting. And the beauty of running a fan like this is this basically controls your environment. There's a few, there's a few things that you can't do with it, but if you have a, a room like this that's kind of normal temperatures and you're able to control the humidity in the tent, then this fan will basically keep you in the parameters that you're looking for. There's more precise controls, but this is a great way to go. I'm gonna give you one more tip while we're standing out here. If you don't have a controller like this and you have a timer, you can plug your exhaust fan into a timer and you can play with it. You can set your lights on full bore and see how hot they get in your tent. They may not overheat your tent if you have a weak grow light. If it's very powerful, it's gonna get too hot. The whole reason you have the fan on there to exhaust the air is to bring in fresh air and also to keep the temperature right. So we want it to run occasionally. We don't want it to never run. So if your grow light's not hot enough, then we just want it on a timer running every so often or on low all the time. The challenge with that is if you live in a, um, a humid environment, you might have to dehumidify. You live in a dry environment like this, you might have to humidify. When it's dry and we're adding humidity in here, when we take the air out, we take the humidity out and it causes our humidity to work on overtime. So you can take a regular timer, have it go on 15 minutes every hour, 15 minutes every two hours. 
You could do every other 15 minutes. Either way, once you've played with it for a day or two, you should be able to keep it in some sort of acceptable range of temperature and humidity. Other than that, if you're getting too hot, you can dim your lights. On the hottest days of the year, it's gonna be a problem. A lot of us run our, night, our lights at night. And the main reason is out here in Colorado, at night, we need the heat in winter. So it's nice to run the grow lights then. You're not paying for heat, you're using the light. And then uh, during the summer when it gets hot, let's say it's 100 degrees out, well, in here, it's gonna be a little bit cooler, which is nice, and if you have an air-conditioned garage or an air-conditioned grow room, then that's gonna be even better. So, just something to consider. Either way, we wanna follow the parameters on the Build-A-Soil schedule. When I open this up, it's gonna change the temperature and the humidity pretty quickly, so that's why I wanted to talk about it first. Inside here, I have a regular humidifier. We call this the Build-A-Soil humidifier because it has a couple of functions I really like. This will not hook into a controller. This has its own controller, it's only to be used as a standalone device. You have to set the settings into it. So it's not good for a controller type. You want a more simple commercial humidifier or just a plug and play humidifier. This one is a standalone device. And the reason why I like it is it has this height extension. So you can raise it above the canopy or you can take it off and you can put it at the canopy level if the plants are smaller. Flip to fill lid. So when you flip this open, you can just pour the water in here. And since we make RO water, and I wanna fill it by hand, it's more convenient than having to take the whole humidifier out. This allows me to put it directly in the device. If it's easy to use, I'm more likely to do it. The next reason why we carry this is it has a large enough reservoir to last more than 24 hours. The problem with most of the standard size units when run on high is that they exhaust all of the water too quickly and then it goes through a big high and low in your grow tent unless you're able to do it twice per day. Of course, the smaller ones work on low but if you've got a four x four tent or larger, it's hard to keep up with the humidity in here in Colorado. So this device works great. It's got a humidity control device. You can set it on the humidity you want and it'll turn on and off automatically. The reason why that's important is if it just runs nonstop, it's gonna be too humid at night. That can lead to bud rot. So I wanna be able to control this to shut itself off. Because of that, you're gonna to wanna to adjust it. So when I first started this, I had it set at 60% humidity. Well, it turned off when my tent was at 40% based on this meter. Since they're in two different locations, I ideally wanna control it here where I'm reading the fan. That's the humidity that I'd like to operate the tent. So I actually set my humidity a little bit higher over here to make sure I got the desired result and this keeps running. You might have to play with it as I guess all I'm saying. Follow the parameters on the Build-A-Soil schedule, play with it a little bit until you know how to get your grow room dialed in. If you buy all the big dog equipment, you won't have to play with it. You just set the settings and literally everything will run but most of us are operating on somewhat of a budget or it just doesn't make sense for the size grow room we have. And so you might have to tinker. So I'm gonna leave that humidity at that height. I'll probably add this one later when the plants get a little bit taller. And then what I need to do right now is move the plants in here because I was able to prove to myself today that this keeps the target environment very similar to the 10 by 10. We were getting it at that ideal temperature, ideal humidity. Next, what we have to do for going into flower is adjust the lights to be at the right intensity based on the height of the canopy. A lot of people wonder how high we set our lights. Each light is individually different. You're gonna to have to check out from your manufacturer what the different PAR or PPFD, they're gonna have maybe a chart on their website that tells you that the strength of the light at different distances. You can use that as a guide and then use a measuring tape and at least you're gonna get somewhere in the wheelhouse. Otherwise, if you have a PAR meter, you can use that and that's what we're gonna to use today. I'm gonna to grab the plants, I'm gonna put them in here, I'm gonna grab the PAR meter and make sure the light is dialed in. And the other thing you're gonna notice if you take a peek under, we're only running four of the eight strips on this Cypress 8. The reason why is we're also only running a Cypress 4 or four strips over the other auto flower. I want it to be the same amount of light in both areas, so we're keeping it consistent. Same light, same color spectrum, same amount of power. Uh, let's grab the auto flower. All right, these have been growing really fast in here, and so I'm pretty excited about that. I'm gonna grab that one off the end and take it into the grow tent. I did bottom water for the first time on Saturday. And so they're gonna be a little bit heavy to move right now. To be careful so I don't spill all the water. Okay, this is an Apogee PAR meter. You don't have to get something that's this expensive. The reason why we got a really nice PAR meter that's full spectrum for these lights is because we're gonna be showing you and we want the information to be accurate. If you buy any PAR meter, the important thing is that it's close. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? We just wanna get within the range. So I'm gonna turn this on. You can see out here, it's like 40, 30, whatever. So let's put it underneath here and see what we're getting in this range. So right now we're a lot lower than we need to be because I just set it in here and the lights are up high. Also, the type of LED that we're using, these are strips. 
The strips are designed to be able to get a lot closer. Some of the other LEDs that we have, like the cobs or the boards, they can push the light further away, and they're designed to be a couple feet from the canopy. This is designed to be a lot closer. So I'm gonna lower this, and then we're gonna take another reading. I wanna keep this assessment of the auto flowers the same. The best way to do that is to use DLI. That's the daily lighting integral. If you're curious what that means, look it up, but I'll give you a basic understanding. The power of the light is one measure. And then the number of hours you run that power is the, is the second part of the formula. Let's just use a thousand, a thousand par or PPFD. That's how intense the light is. Well, if we run that for 12 hours, that's 12 hours at a thousand. That's a lot less light than running 24 hours at a thousand. 24 hours would be double the amount of light the plants are receiving. So what we're uh, shooting for in bloom transition is 40 to 60 on that daily lighting integral number. Well, to get to 60, you really have to go up to about 1400. That is intense. And so I'm conservative. I'm gonna shoot for a thousand over 12 hours. A thousand over 12 hours dials me in at about 45 on the DLI or close to it. So right in here to keep it at, at the same 45 DLI, I can't be at a thousand on the par number. I need to be at 700. I just pulled up, I typed in DLI calculator, use the first website that popped up and you can see the PPFD at 700 for 18 hours gives me a DLI of 45.36. So if I'm at 700 as the intensity in here and I'm at a thousand in there, it's the same on the DLI. That's what I'm gonna run it at. Now I know some of the autoflower guys might run a higher par. 700 is really good for quality. And so I like that. I would be willing to push it up a little higher. I'm probably gonna push it slightly higher in there, but I don't need to do it on the first day of flower. I can ride that in the first couple days. I'll move the light right now, then we're gonna go into the other tent. So let me do that real quick. I might need to drop it a little bit more. All right, so we're a little bit lower than I wanna be right now. Let's see. I'm gonna drop it just a little bit lower to make sure I'm hitting that number. Okay, so we're slightly higher. And that's fine. I can dim this just barely and then take a reading. Okay, there we go. 700, 708, 704, 720. That's the range that I'm looking for. But when you go to the beach and lay out in the sun, you feel the warm energy from it. I feel like plants have gotten used to that over thousands of years and these LEDs, they don't really do that. So if we don't run them at powerful enough, they can have a really good light intensity without the warmth that's normally associated with that. And I feel like that gets the soil warm, the biology going. So I like to keep it at that 75, 80 degrees. To me, that keeps things going. And if I had the lights all the way down and dimmed, it would be 70 in here, not closer to 80. And because it wasn't ramping up in temperature, my exhaust would never kick on and then fresh air wouldn't come in. A grow room is like an ecosystem. We want the heat to kind of rise and the fan to kick on and the heat to drop and the fresh air to come in and the humidity gets stirred up and around and that movement of the air coming in and out brings the co2 with it and it keeps the whole ecosystem going so just things to think about when you're dialing in your environment we've done this many episodes we always kind of go deep on the environment because it's so important i want to be sure as we make more and more of these series i don't repeat the same things ad nauseum so if you're looking for specifics you can always hit up our past seasons but um, I still wanna talk about it. It's my favorite thing to do. So we're gonna do our best. I think it's time to zip this up and then I can monitor the environment, make sure we stay in the parameter. As soon as I zip up the tent door, it'll change everything. So I'm gonna get that going right now. And then we'll move on to taking the, the clones or the cuttings. I'm just moving these to the middle of my light. You can see it's kind of a similar height to what we have in the other tent. I'm gonna get a reading a little bit lower because we were shooting the five to 600 range, okay? So I'm gonna to wanna to lower this light just a little bit. Let's see at the canopy. We're get almost there, 630. It's gonna grow pretty quick, so I don't wanna overshoot it, but I do wanna get it right so that we're keeping a comparison. Normally when I'm growing at home, I don't get this weird. I just know about where I want the par. I get the light kind of in the range and I feel like, cool, I'm close. A lot of times I'll even err on the side of being too low. I'd rather have more quality than like forcing them to yield harder. But in here, I just wanna do what I'm saying I'm doing. Now we're in the range, depending on how I angle it, 708, 715, kind of coming through the middle, seven something. So that's the range that I'm looking for. That seems comparatively equal to what's going on in the other tent. All right, so I've got a few supplies that I'm gonna grab because right now it's time to flip to flower. Besides adjusting the light, I wanna take clones or cuttings off of all of these. 
So I'm gonna take a fresh cut, show you how I do it. And I wanna take more than one. I could just, you know, maybe get a little overconfident and take one from each plant. But in all likelihood, I'm gonna lose one of them. I don't wanna risk it. And so to me, I wanna just make sure that I cover my bases, that I don't lose any of these genetics. It's important. Worst case, I could re-veg it. So if I just lost the clone, I could always turn the lights back to 24 hours or 20 hours and the plant that was flowering, if trimmed right, will start to grow again. It takes a long time. I wouldn't wanna to have to do it if I found that keeper and I didn't keep the cut. So to make sure that I keep it, from the beginning, I like to take clones. And that's part of why I de-leafed in here to encourage a lot of these lowers to jump up, and they have. So now I can take a clone off of the lowers. It's not gonna reduce the yield too much. And I'm gonna take at least two off of each plant. I'm gonna pre-soak them in a solution that I'll show you. I'm gonna use the Q. I'm gonna use some of our horticultural aloe, and then I'm gonna add a third ingredient called full power or fulvic acid. You don't have to use any of these. You can just soak them in plain water. In fact, I know people that root their cuttings by putting them in plain water on their kitchen counter in a glass, just like a house plant. All they do is in the morning when they wake up, they dump the water out, they put fresh water in, they put their plants back in. They do that every day so that it doesn't get moldy. And usually at about 15 to 20 days, you'll start to get plant roots. Problem is, is they're not as vigorous, doesn't happen as fast, and it's not as likely to succeed. So even though it's possible, it's not the best way to go. We're gonna show you a way that works for us where we soak it in some of our products. Um, it soaks up the aloe and everything into the plant as it sits in the cup. And then the next day, I normally put them into my cloning medium, whether that be the aero cloner or whether I use pucks, like I'm gonna use this time with a dome and a tray. If you want all the details on that, check out our previous seasons. We go really into detail. We show every single step and we get weird on it. The other thing I wanna show you before I finish taking all the cuts is how I'm gonna clean up the lowers. I've been letting them just grow out and I've been letting them grow like in the soil. So if you look in here, there's leaves that are like down in here. There's stuff that I would normally not leave, like these little pieces that aren't gonna grow up to be tops. I've left that because I wanna take clones off of there. And since we're going into the first day of flower, I like to clean everything up, all the lowers. Normally when I've done this in the past, I'll have a screen and the screen sits on here. And once I get the plant bent and woven underneath the screen and it's totally full, I'll clean up the lowers all the way up to the screen, then we'll go to flower. And since I'm just going with another method where you put a few more plants, instead of weaving the screen, you just have more plants, I'm going to clean up the lowers right now without the screen in place, making my life a lot easier since I don't have to reach all the way under the screen. Once I'm done cleaning it up, I'll show you what it looks like in another episode, but I'm gonna at least show you my process on one or two plants, then I'm gonna spend some time in here and just get the job done. In here, in this quadrant, same thing. I mean, look at this chem, this uh, Beefcake D. It is a beautiful plant. The structure, these lower branches without any encouragement besides a couple de-leafing are just perfectly grown up to match the height. So what I'll be able to do is come down here and take like this lower one off and maybe even take a cut off the cut, but I'll make a decision as we go. I'll talk about it. I'm gonna take clones off of all the plants in here. The Northern Lights, I mean, it's like a shaggy dog, but it's wall to wall in there right now. That was not like that before the weekend. It's still throwing a little hate at me with some tips that are a little bit burned and old school genetics. So we're not perfect, but I think that you're gonna see some really good quality come out of here regardless. As far as this goes, same thing. Clean up the lowers once I'm done taking the cuts. That'll really improve the airflow in there. One of the things that can happen in living soil is that mulch layer. It's got all the cover crop from last time. It's got all of the row beetles and predator mites. And if you just let it stay all funky in there and you don't have enough airflow and the humidity's high and the heat's high, you can start to have some of your beneficials like row beetles or even some of the soil mites run up on your plant. And while it's not really an issue in veg and they don't hurt the plant, we don't wanna encourage life to go up on the plant. So we wanna increase the airflow above our mulch layer and on the mulch layer and part of, part of why we defoliate in the indoor grow room. So let me show you what I'm gonna do and I'll get started. Well, this is pretty straightforward. I just wanna show you what I'm doing so that we document it. And that's really the point of these series is I think that we wanna show you that we are growers, that we do this, that we use all of our own products, that we're constantly, I mean, if you ask my staff, I'm tinkering with new soil recipes, we're test thousands and thousands of dollars in soil tests non-stop tinkering with ways to affect things that what might make a difference, might, might be a game changer. And then we're constantly growing. So 24 seven, 365, you will never catch me without a grow. I'm not saying in the future, there's not gonna be times where life gets busy and maybe I have phases where I go without a grow, but certainly in the last 10 years, there has not been one day of my life that I didn't have a grow going. I know that when you're looking for information, 
a lot of times you just want to recognize that they're at least doing it, right? They're at least participating. It's not just some sales pitch. So that's what this is. It's, it's a constant proof and it keeps us on the tip of our toes as well because we know how challenging it is to get the results that we want. So I've got some water. So about a gallon and a quarter. And I go a little bit harder when I'm doing the clone soak. The main thing I'm just trying to do is get some of the plant compounds from the aloe vera plant. It has a lot of good compounds. When I take my cuttings and they're freshly cut and I stick them in the cup, they actually absorb some of it. So I'm gonna stick this in here. It talks about using a teaspoon per gallon. I do like a teaspoon in the cup that I'm doing normally, or like half a teaspoon. So I go kind of hard on it. A gallon and a half, I'm gonna put this in a whole bunch of different cups. Five, six, about six teaspoons into a gallon and a half. So I went a lot harder than you normally would. I just feel like when I'm soaking it in the clones instead of feeding it to them, I want them to be able to absorb it. Now, fulvic acid is really potent, so I'm not gonna play with the numbers at all on this. 10 to 30 milliliters per gallon. So 20 milliliters a gallon would be the rate. I don't have my um, shot glass here. You could just use the cap. If you've done this a lot, you know that one ounce is 30 milliliters. I wanna go a little less than an ounce. So a little less than an ounce. And I have more than a gallon in there. So I'm playing it safe on my numbers. And then this is the Kuyaha. I'm adding this just as a wetting agent. And there's some, the saponins have some beneficial properties. And so this is an eighth of a teaspoon per gallon. I really don't need to do much. So I'm probably doing a quarter teaspoon there. Now the aloe, sometimes you need to let it soak for just a minute when it's really cold water to actually get to absorb into the water. We have the flakes, those absorb a little bit easier, but the horticultural aloe, I think has more of the hormones that we're looking for, more of the plant compounds. And it's freeze dried, so it takes a minute to reconstitute in the water. And I just keep stirring it until that happens. You can also let it soak for a little bit and stir it later. So let me let that sit. And then what I'll do is I'll get my cup ready and then I'll stir it one more time. So when you're doing this at home, I encourage you to keep really good um, notation of which plant is which. Number of different ways you can do it. You can use some masking tape and just kind of tape it along the side and notate which plant is which. We have the plant tags you've seen us use. You just label it, wrap it around the stalk of the plant and it tells you what it is. Since these are all the same and they're just gonna be numbered, I'm gonna go top to bottom, left to right, just like we read a book. That way I'm certain I know which one is which. So I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So in the future, if I forget, I'll just look up this video. I don't know, the top left is one, Pakololo one. And I'm gonna put number one. That's it. Now I can go through and label all the cu cups, but like I told you, I'm just gonna do a couple plants here right now. And then I'm gonna do all of this on my own time because it might take me a little while. This has been soaking for a little bit, so I'm gonna stir this. I put a lot more aloe than usual, so it takes a minute to get into solution. I don't need to have it completely full, just enough to soak the, the cuttings in. And the Sharpie won't really come off, so I feel confident about that. All right, so here we are. Now. In a commercial setting, you'd be sterilizing scissors, you'd be using a different razor blade or cleaning in between each cut because you don't want to pass on viruses and all this weird stuff. At home, I encourage you to just have fun for the most part. I just use scissors that are relatively clean and I just cut my cut and I've never had any problems with that. So I'm gonna show you this plant. This is the number one, that's why I'm choosing it. And I'm gonna go to the bottom. Now, normally you would just choose one that had at least two nodes. So the roots come out of where a plant part is growing. So down here is where I want to kind of cut it. But since I'm cutting it off the plant, I'm just gonna go right to the stalk and take the lowermost couple. And so let's see, I can see right here the two lowest by going to the stalk are this one and on the other side, the other one. So I'm just gonna cut them right now. One and two. And let's see if they're big enough for me to use. Those are big enough and healthy enough. Even all the way buried underneath there, really healthy plants. I don't see any pest issues. I take the time to, do a quick look. Is there any thrip or spider mite or powdery mildew or anything weird? It looks really good in here. So that is ideal. I've shown you in the clone series in the past how to strip these and cut these and all this. These are a little bit small. If I was really worried about it, I would probably take the next two off as well. I might do that when I go clean up all the lowers on there, but I'm gonna leave as much on these plants as possible and kind of just let them naturally do their thing since I've got a little space to fill in, I'm not too worried. So if I was working, I would just put these like this and I could always clean them up later. But usually what I do is I strip these leaves off. You can use scissors. The bottom ones I sometimes strip because I'm trying to open up the stock a little. We've talked about all this, check out our past series. And then for now, when I go to puck it up, I'll probably put a fresh 45 degree cut on there and the roots will probably come out of this spot where I just removed the lower set of leaves. And I might shorten that a bit to fit in the puck so that that location is within the rooting puck. 
where the roots are gonna come out. But for right now, I'm just gonna leave that on there so they can just soak up the goodness. A lot of times what you'll see me do is either remove these leaves or actually cut part of the leaf off. Now, you don't have to do this. Some people think it's a problem as far as like a vector for disease. Some people say it's very, very important to do. I started trimming this a little bit because I'd have a full tray and I didn't want all the leaves overlapping, causing um, pockets of condensation. So take it for what you want. There's a lot of reasons why people do that, but it seems to work for me. You can leave the leaves on. I know that with this many plants, there's probably gonna be a whole bunch in that tray. So I'm gonna be snipping some of those off. I'm gonna let that soak. Oops. And I'll do the same to the next one. But there we go. There is the PO, the Pacalolo one, number one. I've got two cuts here and I'm gonna back up two of each. When I'm cleaning up the lowers, if I'm gonna remove one that's really low and I'm, it's not needed and it's particularly pretty, I might throw it in the batch and then choose my favorite two to root up later. Or heck, I might choose if there's an extra beautiful plant in there, I might keep extras and then just give them away to the guys here at work. Then somebody else can go root more and it's a gift. So you can just give a plant like this to a friend if they know what they're doing and give it to them in a cup of water. Or if they don't know what they're doing and you're really trying to help them, you can root it for them and then pass them a fully rooted cut. But um, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Nature is abundant like that. So I'll set this down and then I'm gonna show you how to clean up the lowers on a plant. A lot of people will throw those scraps just in the mulch layer. I've got plenty of clover and stuff that I'll be chopping, dropping later. I've got the uh, straw that's in here. And so I'm not too worried about adding to that mulch layer right now. I'm gonna take these and put it in the worm bin and I can use those worm castings later. That's what I'm gonna do with them. I'm gonna clean up the number one because I already took a cutting off of that. You see how this branch is so low, it's probably never gonna make it. I probably should have taken that as a clone. It's just so low and the other plants right here. So I don't want it to waste its energy on that. So I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna take that one off. I'm just double checking before I squeeze the scissors. Um, I think that's gonna be a great cutting too. And because I don't want it to just throw it in the scrap bucket. I'm gonna strip it right here and just throw it in the water and I'm gonna keep going. Probably should have done this first. I just knew I needed at least two cuts, so. Okay, there we go, there's a good one. Let's see, is there another lower that's too low? That looks good there. This one on this side, it doesn't have another plant competing, so I'm gonna leave that and I'm gonna see what it actually does. Now, you see all these leaves down here? I'm gonna remove every one of them. And you see all these? I'm gonna lollipop what they call stripping the side branches off of all of these except for the top couple of spots. Just because I, I th it's not gonna do anything down low. This is gonna give an opportunity for growth, but I don't need this really lower inside stuff to be a part of that equation, especially with a flat canopy like that. It's gonna increase the airflow to have all this removed. So I'm gonna get in there and clean this up, then I'll show you what this looks like, and then we're gonna do that on the rest of them. So if you look at each branch, I'm taking, except for the top, two to three nodes here, everything else off below that. Same thing, here's another branch. You can see I stripped it up, except for the top three, basically. The top, top, the second, and the third. Everything else below that I'm just removing. The other thing I'm gonna do is take these couple of big leaves off again. Normally I leave some of those, but in this type of setup, you saw it quickly in four days, it just bushed up like crazy. So I'm gonna give it one more opportunity to do that here. That'll give me access of light to all these lower branches and they'll shoot up again. So I think that's pretty much what I'd like to do. It's amazing how uniform this plant is. That's about what I want. Last thing, which I told you, I was gonna grab these and feed them to the worm bin. I don't have a reason to leave them in here. I want to do that. I want this clover to get one more shot at growing. And so if I leave the mulch here like that and the clover, now that the light can get through, it'll start to grow through a little bit. But you can see how all this is stripped up. The legs are shaved, we call it. And so now everything below a certain point has been removed. The airflow is dramatically increased. And now the tops that we want are going to be growing basically. The main top of the branch 
it's gonna be better flour. It's gonna be all that lower stuff. It's hard to trim. It's not as good to smoke. Just want the tops off of each. And if I was to have even more plants this in, than this in here and have flipped to flower already, you could actually remove all the side branches except for the main top and have just the main cola. The reason why I like to have more side branches is indoors, really in any environment until I've grown the flower before, if you get a really big top bud and it gets too dense and you really do a good job on yield, it can be hard to dry perfectly without getting the moisture to the inside just right before, before you get bud rot or anything like that late in flower. So I like to have multiple tops and this is a great number of plants, nine and a four by four. I mean, it was very fast to fill up less, you know, about two weeks of edge. I think we did what, 16, 17 days. So we could have gone a little bit faster, but we were able to determine the sex before we transplanted. So they were pretty small. And I think we probably, depending on how much these stretch, we could have flipped a little sooner. Also, if for some reason, these don't stretch a lot. We could have waited a little longer. When I'm running genetics for the first time, I give myself a little bit of extra room just in case they go crazy. I'd rather have better quality and an easier grow than have overshot and overshot the stretch and overshot the crowding and everything's just harder the whole way through. So I hope those uh, tips of advice help. I've got a lot of work to do in here. I've got to take clones off of every single one of these. I've got to label all of the cups that I keep them all. I've got to go clean up the lowers. So they all look like this and that's just one bed. So while it's pretty much low effort when it comes to a no-till grow, there's that phases in every type of crop that you have with tomatoes, vining them up, right? Uh, with lettuce, it's the harvesting and the seeding. It's this, when you go to flower in an indoor environment and you're taking clones and you're defoliating, that's kind of that big push of work that you do. And then from then on, it's pretty much autopilot. We'll do one more big defoliation after that and we'll discuss it when we get there. But after we do this big round of work, we're gonna kind of kick back and watch it grow. Looking forward to that. Looking forward to updating you and documenting this entire process of the YouTube series. If you've got questions about taking the clones, about defoliating, about the grow tent, the four x four, a lot of times I see other growers that follow the build a soil way. If they know a little more, they're answering questions. So it's really cool to see that community starting to come together. I can't wait to do the Beefcake D. Both look just beautiful right now. So those are gonna be really fun to take the clones off of. We're not gonna take clones off of the auto flowers, which I guess if you don't know, now's a good time to address it. Part of the reason I do not like autoflowers is you can't clone them. They are based on a ticking clock. On an autoflower, if you cut a branch off, that branch is still a ticking clock. It's still gonna flower. You can't just keep it under higher amount of light to hold it back. You're just hoping that you can buy more seeds and that those more seeds were produced by a breeder that's of enough quality where you're gonna get something similar the next time. In the past, that would almost never happen. And so a lot of us kind of got fed up with it or we'd throw autoflowers outside early to avoid pollen, to get an early crop for fun before the, you know, before late season harvest. So there's reasons for them. But for me, one of the biggest downsides to it is you can't keep a clone of the winner. This has been episode 13, taking the clones, moving the autoflowers. Last but not least for the day, I've got to change the clock. It's not that exciting. I'm just going to open up my app. I'm going to change it to be 12 hours of light in here. Tomorrow is really the first day of flower once I've adjusted timers. So today's day zero. We took the cuts. I got more work to do. Until then, I'll see you guys on the next episode.